Okay, so the other day we were looking at uh, variations of the charge qubit evolving towards the transmon. <coughs> we saw just the basic design with a capacitor that was bigger than the charge qubit. We put a junction, and all together this guy makes a more, more stable and more robust qubit. After that, we saw the design in uh, New Martinez group of a cross-shaped capacitor that allows independent control of the couplings in the four ports, where the squid would be here. And this is modeled as a big capacitance. And uh, after that, I promised that we would have today a look at uh, tunable couplings. So, uh, there are many de qubit designs where one can have a look at how it's done, but I thought it should be better to do it now. Uh, where is the eraser? Wow. Okay, so, as I said, there are many papers dealing with tunable couplings in circuit. I just chose this one because it's rather recent and it's rather complete in that uh, uh, it contains a study of the coupling, uh, Hamiltonian for it, how it's derived, and also an application for doing quantum gates. So we, c we can use this idea to have a look at different concepts on uh, gate designs and, and characterization. So that was the X-mon, this trans -mon with a cross shape. And now we are going to modify it by introducing a big inductor here. Let's see what name I give it to that. SG. We still have this capacitance for the trans -mon part and a squid for the uh, hopping of Cooper pairs in and outside the island. And uh, what I want to first convince you is that this design is not different from a Transmon Hamiltonian. So this guy here doesn't really change, the, doesn't affect the dynamics of the resulting model. So you have now to look at two nodes. Let me get rid of this, yes, to make the, the drawing simpler because it really doesn't affect, it's all contained inside the capacitance. So you have two nodes. And the Lagrangian contains uh, only one capacit capacitive term, which be related to the flux here. It's the flux. Phi B is the difference between the flux in this point and the ground plane, which we take to be zero. And then you have some inductive terms, uh, which account for the big inductor. A plus J cosine of Phi A B minus Phi A to Phi Phi zero. And, uh, well, this. This gives you a clue that only phi b is going to have dynamics because the, the equations of motion for the for this circuit they are made of the, uh, with the following form. Okay. So all fluxes are present in the inductive part, which contributes to this term phi a and phi b but only one of them has a non-zero part here. That means that uh, at least one of these fluxes is going to be frozen, effectively, and be dependent on the other one. So now it's a matter of, of how you define it. So I chose, you know, the way I wrote the circuit is designed to make phi A the constant guy, so that uh, it's a quotient of motion. Uh, implies that 1 over Lg phi A has to be equal to the critical current 
which is modified by these external flags and the sinus of 2 pi phi 0 phi b minus phi a that would be the equation and what we can do now is that we can introduce uh, two independent variables instead of phi a and phi b we can introduce phi a and then the flux of the qubit which I simply call phi and you see that basically what this uh, this is doing is that it uh, divides the voltage difference between this segment and this segment fixing this uh, difference as a function of this difference okay, so it's just uh, balancing the difference of fluxes between both segments so the f then what it means is that the flux at this point is a function of the flux difference of the qubit is a function of the uh, qubit properties and it will follow it uh, smoothly as the qubit evolves in time uh, well, you can now uh, replace this uh, inside the circuit and write a Lagrangian for a different variable which will be this phi and it's modified now so you simply replace phi b as a function of phi a plus phi and there you have that you have again phi dot square but because phi a phi b is equal to phi plus phi a and we can express phi a in terms of phi itself okay you more or less follow no we can uh, write here that will be an effective inductance for the junction j j square plus e j cosine 2 pi phi 0 phi you follow more or less okay so this again a qubit Hamiltonian nothing uh, nothing fancy so you just have renormalized a little bit the capacitive terms and we will work in a limit in which this correction is of order one so it's very small so it's not a deviation from the original model and you can uh, also include here sorry I forgot it j to g pi square which uh, is simply compressing a little bit the the cosine that you have there so but the idea is that uh, this is again like a qubit uh, potential you had the cosine originally that uh, gives rise to the transform energy level structure and now you compress it a little bit with this other term but nothing much changes so the, the, the energy levels are going to be again such that we can work with it as a qubit and the idea is that at this point the flux is a function of the qubit properties and in this uh, group, the Martinez group they introduce a very nice idea which is to take two of these qubits identical ones and couple them so the idea is because this is a function of the qubit property and this flux is a function of the qubit property I'm now going to join those fluxes with an inductive term and the notation is easy which can be affected by some external flux 
And uh, there are two things to this. Well, this, this guy is a function of the flux difference. So it's, it's going to uh, uh, favor that both qubits end up more or less in a parallel fashion. The other thing is that because it's an inductive term, which is built from Josephson junctions, it's tunable. So we can uh, change the magnitude of this coupling by applying an external flux uh, to it. So th both ideas are, are there. If we try to do the same thing with a capacitive term, we would indeed get a qubit, qubit coupling, but there would be no simple way of making that tunable, apart from making the qubits of resonance from each other. And uh, so the, the, the idea is that now the Hamiltonian, or the Lagrangian, it's easier to work with that, will be the same one as before. We cannot, in principle, uh, make the same assumptions uh, regarding the qubit properties. They will come out naturally. So we have this term. We have cosine pi zero to pi, the same one. pi sc minus pi d phi zero to pi and now we have in addition to that this external coupling which was not there before uh, but we have the same uh, properties as before. Phi B and Phi C are the only guys which have an explicit time dependence in this Lagrange. So we could, in principle, uh, uh, find out the equations for Phi A and Phi B D, and uh, they are nonlinear. They, they involve sinus and cosinus, but we can linearize them because we assume that this guy is going to be small. So we would have something like this. Phi B minus Phi A is equal to Phi A by G. These equations come simply from uh, writing this equal to zero and this equal to zero. So the, the fluxes that don't have dynamic, they are fixed at the stationary point and depend on the other variables of your problem. And give rise to these equations once we linearize the, the sinus that appear here. When you differentiate the cosinus, you get the sinus, you can linearize it and get these linear contributions here, 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 and here. And uh, what this uh, tells you is that you have, uh, before we had only one independent variable for one qubit, and now you have two independent variables for two qubits. Qubit one, qubit two. And we can express uh, phi a and phi d as a function of the qubit properties once more. You follow this derivation so far? Have any questions? So we have, we, we, as before, we, we wrote a Lagrangian for a qubit, and we found that uh, one of the two equations uh, doesn't have time in it, so we can solve it explicitly and get rid of one variable. This also happens quite often in classical mechanics when you do Lagrangian mechanics. So you simply you are in getting rid of the constraints of your problem. And here we do the same thing, but now, before we only had this part of the equation, where phi a was explicitly written in terms of the qubit properties, but now because of the coupling, we have some admixtures of the two fluxes. So each qubit is influencing the other one. This is what 
this contribution is uh, expressing. But these are uh, just, uh, 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 I say, subtle points of, of this Lagrangian. So these are things that we can get rid of now. We can eliminate phi a and phi d and express them in terms of the of the qubit properties. The idea is that uh, you have these expressions, phi d modulo typos, of course. One to Lc plus two Lg. Lc plus Lg phi two, phi one, phi a is the same thing. Da, 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 da. But now here you have phi one and phi two. Uh, notice that if we take the limit uh, in which this guy is extremely tight, I mean, it's, uh, it's not there, you recover the dependence of phi d on just phi two and phi a on phi one. But in other cases, they have, they have a mutual influence. So what we are saying here is that we have a mutual inductance between the two qubits. So when, once we, we write this in the Hamiltonian, it will be more clear. So we take the, these expressions and we substitute them inside here and keep terms uh, up to second order in the in the different uh, the different qubit properties. When you do that, so basically what you're doing is you have you start with this part of the uh, interaction. With the inductive uh, term, which expand, we expand up to second order. So we keep this term and those two terms up to second order, assuming that the changes are going to be small. We substitute those uh, dependencies. Uh, what comes out is terms that go like uh, some modified inductance phi one square that contribute to the qubit Hamiltonian and then one term that goes like Lg square to Lg plus Lc 1 over Lg square phi 1 phi 2 which is the effective qubit qubit coupling so that's uh, almost everything. Now, uh, the usual thing that uh, we can do is, uh, as before with the transmon, we can regard this as an unharmonic oscillator with its uh, variable phi 1 and phi 2, and quantize it uh, around the zero flux so that um, you will have your Hewitt Hamiltonian for one and two After a qubit minus the unharmonic part, and once you replace this, you have to simply put phi i goes like the square root of. Um, 
h bar charge h bar set to a dagger i which goes like square root of omega and the effective inductance of the qubit and if you have computed these terms it turns out that these guys goes like square root of omega 2 j square j a g a i plus a i dagger. So the corrections that appear here due to the coupling, they are of the form the frequency of the qubit um, to a mutual inductance a j plus a g a two a one a two where m is just the mutual inductance up here before there which is tunable now well, let's follow this part so you have your transmon energy levels 0, 1, 2 the lowest frequency will be the 0, 1 this one is slightly unharmonic 1, 2 is correct, corrected by these contributions and in addition to this you have the possibility that the true transmons they exchange excitations through these uh, operators which describe the extraction of an excitation on one transmon and the creation of an excitation on the other transmon considering that they are unharmonic structures of course Oops. The, if you look at the paper that introduces these qubits there is an alternative explanation which may be more satisfying for some of you. It goes like this. It's in, in, in terms of circuit properties and uh, current. The idea is that uh, you would have the current that is moving through the qubit which in the end is, depends on your fluxes and this current is divided into a, a part that goes through this uh, inductor and a part that goes to the coupling between qubits this is going to be the dominant part, this is going to be almost the entirety, entirety of the current and this small fraction that goes here of qubit 1 can be estimated using just the effective inductance of these uh, coupling junctions and the inductance of this segment to be of this form now if you assume that this current is going to mostly flow through there the current associ is associated to a flux difference uh, here which would be Lg squared let's see Lg so that uh, this would be uh, your mutual inductance between uh, the two devices basically that's uh, how it is reasoned there uh, for me it's not so obvious as uh, writing down the full couple circuit and seeing that indeed this is this is true uh, I had copied the images of what comes out of this design, you see it on the left, on the right, sorry. Uh, when you consider this Hamiltonian, this coupling Hamiltonian, in principle it goes uh, 
it applies to any number of excitations. So you don't need to stay to the two lowest energy states of a transmog. In principle, it could have zero, one, two, and so on. But uh, if we stay within these two states and uh, the qubits are more or less degenerate, you would have this model. which is you have a frequency, an energy of the one state of the first qubit, plus the energy of the one state of the second qubit. And then this guy, which will be your coupling strength, it de-excites the qubit one, and it excites the qubit two, and vice versa. So uh, there is this usual level structure that is seen a lot in NMR, also in atomic systems. You would have here. Uh, let's assume that they, they don't need to be exactly equal. So you would have this. This would be omega zero one prime, and this would be the state where the second qubit is excited. This is the state where the first qubit is excited. This is the state where nobody is seeing anything. And then you have, uh, on top of this, uh, or from here, the state with two excitations, one on each, uh, on each uh, qubit. So what does this guy do? What is, how do you read it physically? Within this picture. So assume that you have a ball, you put it here. Does this Hamiltonian do anything to that ball? This is telling you that you have to de-excite qubit one and excite qubit two, or de-excite qubit two and excite qubit one. So you, you cannot do any of those tasks here. Okay, so no way. If you put your initial state here, what this is telling you? Is that there is a tunneling amplitude for this guy to jump here and here. So there are only two levels connected these two. Because they are connected, what happens is that if you draw the levels, they will be separated an amount which is or the order of uh, 2G. And uh, if you put the ball here, uh, in principle, it, it could go to other states. For instance, it can go to 2,0 or it can go to zero two. But if uh, the energy difference between those states and this one is sufficiently large, we can forget about those processes. So what this guy is doing, this uh, coupling, is uh, splitting these energy levels. And uh, you could now try to spectroscopically resolve this splitting. So you could try to drive uh, one qubit or both qubits, and if they are uncoupled, you could excite this transition or this transition separately for each qubit and monitor them. But if they are coupled, you will not excite these transitions, you will excite transitions to these admixtures of energy levels, okay? which are simply one over square root zero one minus one zero and this one. And that's uh, what is uh, seen there. So you have uh, a plot of the resonance spectrum of the two qubits as a function of, of uh, the flux that they impart on this coupling term so that uh, they can tune the effective inductance of this circuit. And you see that uh, initially the qubits are weakly coupled. This can happen due to proximity effects or, or simply just because of the cables that are joining them, and by increasing the coupling, 
they can change sign and then cancel the coupling, the residual coupling, and then increase the coupling beyond the residual coupling and uh, to a very large value. So uh, basically that plot is, is not too obvious in how it works, but they get a non-off ratio of the coupling, which is about 1,000 according to the experimental fits, which is pretty nice. Um, Yes, you followed so far the discussion. We are now going to take this model for granted and use it in other contexts. And uh, the same idea can be implemented with other circuits. Uh, if we have time today, we will uh, finish the discussion with flash qubits, and uh, those qubits also, also couple very na naturally in an inductive fashion because they are current qubits. Uh, but in general, this can be extended to many designs of, of uh, Hamiltonians and, and circuits. So the only reason I chose this paper is because it contains all the ingredients, switchability, uh, spectroscopy, and then also quantum gates. Okay, I shouldn't have deleted that. But Yes. For me, it's not quite clear. Uh, I want to to couple these two uh, identical qubits, uh, it's most, and I use a, a, a squid, no? So the, the density is a squid in the end. Um, they use a bias junction, but it's the same principle. Okay, so I, I can in principle use uh, just an inductance. And that uh, if you do any, if this is static, then it, it's going to be a fixed coupling. Uh, then, then you don't need to do that. You can do simply capacitive coupling between qubits. Uh, sure. Now, what I want to ask, I don't need the something that is non-linear, just for. No, we are using, you are using this in the linear regime. In the linear, regime, okay. But because we have linearized all the calculations, uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. so we we have working with. Quadratic Hamiltonians all the time. The derivation I did was all the time quadratic. Yeah, okay. This is, uh, this was my and uh, we don't use nonlinearity there. Uh, it's very rarely used for uh, purpose of tunability. Mm -hmm. okay, we only use the fact that you have a tunable inductor, and the fact that the the, the um, actually the the coupling, as we saw with the squid, you have a flux. And your Hamiltonian looks like the original EG, EJ, well, whatever, uh, cosine of the flux, pi divided by pi zero, and the cosine of the flux difference that goes uh, through the squid. And the, the beauty of this design is that this can take values from minus one to plus one, all the way. So not only can you tune the magnitude of the inductor, you can change sign. So this device can cancel other couplings, which is what you see there. So the, the coupling initially is simply is, is negative, but very small, and then it cancels the direct coupling between the two qubits, and then it's the dominant contribution, and the sign does, doesn't really matter for this purposes. So it's, it's both things, the fact that you can tune the inductance and that you can change sign. And this idea, I mean, it's not the first time it's not that has been used, it's not in this paper. This is quite pervasive through the uh, uh, literature of superconducting circuits. Many groups have used it. Uh, the thing is that the Martinez group have used it very successfully in, uh, in many different experiments for coupling qubits or coupling qubits with resonators and things like that. So it's uh, simply that they have lots of experience with that. Now, as I told you, we, we are going to use now the fact that we have a coupling to uh, implement a quantum gate. And the idea is, uh, well, I shouldn't have deleted that level scheme. We are going to use it again. We have uh, one zero, zero one, and zero zero. And uh, instead of, I mean, there are, there are many ways you can do a gate. One possibility would be to use directly the interaction to make this guy as resonant as possible, 
and to use dynamics with this Hamiltonian, which will be basically g plus 2 g1 minus in the key with uh, g2 minus. That would be when you get rid of uh, uh, the frequencies because omega is going to be omega prime. In the interaction picture, uh, this, this would be your effective interaction. This, remain, this leaves this stage invariant, and if you wait a certain time, you can get a square root of a swap. I mean, it's not a full swap, not a full exchange of excitations from here to here. This guy starts here and then ends up in a superposition of these two guys. And that's a universal gate. But instead of doing that, which may be hard to calibrate, uh, this group and other groups are using um, phase gates. So there are basically, as I told you, two uh, kinds of gates. Ones that uh, swap elements in the basis, they couple different states and they mix them. And there are other gates which are diagonal in the qubit basis. Those gates are based on the idea that you have some uh, eigenstates that are going to be dependent on time. Okay, this can be 0, 0, 1, 0, 0, 1, 1, 1. And you tune the energies of these uh, eigenstates in time by connecting and disconnecting interactions, by applying external fields, and so on. In that case, evolution is very easy to compute. The unitary that describes the evolution with this guy is simply the exponential, uh, 1 over h bar, the integral in time of these energy differences that you are imposing. Okay. That's a very simple uh, application. And you can see this idea used throughout the whole spectrum of uh, quantum information implementations. There are gates that uh, either exchange uh, excitations or Im involve some work in the system. Uh, which uh, mix different eigenstates, and there are gates which really commute with the basis of your experimental qubit state. And this is reasonably easy to do in many cases, because what you are simply doing is that you can change, for instance, the energy of the 0, 0 state with respect to the 1, 0 state, and the 0, 1, and with respect to the 1, 1. So one gate that would be enough for us would be a gate that uh, is a control phase that you would get simply phase one for everybody and for instance you can do for the one one you will get a different phase that would be one possibility there are many other possibilities uh, you can get different phases here here and here and the, uh, there are conditions for universality that are very easy to estimate we simply have to separate phases that can be attributed to local operations from phases that really entangle the system. But let's assume you have something like that. How you can achieve that? Well, you can achieve that if you can shift the energy of this guy up and down without affecting the other ones. It's just that. So change the energy of one level. You cannot do this with external fields. Because if you apply an external field on one qubit and another one, these ones are also going to move. Okay? So the only way to change the energy of this guy with respect to these others is with interactions. The same thing can be applied if you choose other states. And the idea that they use in this experiment, and which is used in other ones, is that there are states here which we have neglected before. Maybe this one, zero, two. One is going to be higher than the other one. And uh, they work under certain conditions. So the frequency of the qubits are tuned so that these guys are really not tying to each other. But this guy is proximal to this other state. So in principle, there can be some residual coupling between them. More precisely, the idea is that uh, you can compute the energy states of your system, the eigen energies, and you would have a plot like this. This would be the energy 
of state one one. No. Uh, the frequency of qubit one. This will be the energy of state one one, and this will be the energy of state zero two. So in principle, by uh, increasing this energy, shifting one qubit up, you can bring this state close to to this other one without touching the other qubit. And if they are uncoupled, you simply have an, a, a crossing of energy levels. But it's, but they, they basically, you, they don't see each other. Okay? There is an energy shift, but this energy shift would be similar to the energy shift that this guy gets. But if they are coupled, then what happens is that the, the structure of Energy levels looks like this, with a splitting, which is, well, it's not 2G, but it's, it's, uh, it's proportional to 2G, modulo the separation between them. And so the idea is, is, is quite uh, remarkably simple. You start, say, at this point, this will be the other point. Uh, well, well, yeah, I'm going to exaggerate it a little bit. This point, this will be the other point. This is your configuration. Of omega and omega prime places you there. And what they do is they switch on and off the interaction. What happens is that if you do it adiabatically, you change G in a, in a time scale that is uh, longer than the splitting between these two levels. You simply remain in the instantaneous eigenstates of your configuration. Okay? It's going to shift up at an energy, but you don't distort the eigenstate. You don't transition to other higher energy states. This is the same adiabatic principle that we've seen before. So what you're doing is that this guy shifts up and down in energy just because it's interacting with this one. There is also a shift of this guy because you maybe or not, depending on where you are placed. But the dominant contribution that gives rise to interaction will be the integral of this uh, energy difference as a function of time. That's something that you can uh, tune experimentally. Another possibility that uh, you can use when you don't have uh, tunable coupling is that and other groups do it, is your, your coupling is fixed, but you can uh, start far away where the coupling is really relevant, and you can move up and down adiabatically. And it's the same idea. Okay? So nothing changes. And, well, they calibrate it experimentally and they get, uh, they get uh, a possibility of having an entangling gate between the two qubits. Uh, it's in the next pictures, I think. And uh, while well, the scheme is what you see there, this is the 1-1 one, one excitation, uh, which is more or less what I draw here. And uh, they estimate the fidelities of the gates. Uh, on the left, you see fidelities of the single qubit operations, which appear by driving just one qubit or the other one. And on the right, you see the fidelity of the two qubit operations. Now, you know what the fidelity is. So it's simply the distance between the state that you want to construct with the unitary operation and the one that you have actually achieved in the experiment. So how many of you have taken quantum information lectures? One, everybody. Okay, well, I, I have some material that I'm going to give anyway because I prepared it. <laughs> Which discusses uh, how these uh, fidelities are estimated experimentally. And it's just uh, online with the discussion of this paper whose reference should be in the note if it's not there. Let's make a break now. We continue after. So let's see if we can uh, sketch a little bit how these fidelities are analyzed and then move on to the last qubit. 
Uh, the idea would be that you are trying to describe a unitary operation, which is a four by four matrix. Well, it's a four by four matrix that acts in a complex vector uh, dimension four, because you have state zero, zero, one, zero, zero, one, and one, one. That would be the idea. A scenario. In practice, uh, what happens is that you're never going to implement uh, a unitary operation exactly. So it's not going to be just this matrix. You implement a transformation that is not, I mean, this would be for pure states. You would have your new state would be uh, transformed by this matrix, but in practice, you always have to uh, consider that you have a general transformation on density matrices. So even if the initial state is pure, the outcome is going to be mixed. I'm going to give you some examples of, of instances that we have seen where this happens. So, For instance, you have that you can have a spontaneous emission of the qubit, which we describe with this map. Rho 0, 0, plus Rho 1, 1, Amma T, Rho 1, 0, Amma T half, half, Rho 0, 1, Rho 1, 1, Gamma T. Okay, so this can be written uh, in a compact fashion like this. Two indices that are 0 or 1. And then you have you have this transformation and P. And in the end you will be able to write it into this cross form where you have operators. So with certain weights, let's call this probability kappas you have different operations are being operated onto the density matrix. Okay? So this, this would be one possibility. You have a spontaneous emission for your system, and this will be happening over a small period of time, delta t, which is what you have here. Okay. And in general, you, you have to consider that uh, E is acting uh, together with your uh, unitary, the gate that you are implemented, implementing. No? So, because they are together, the simplest thing that you could assume is that one, the one is uh, acting after the other one. So you would have this kind of transformation, which would be the actual thing that you would measure experimentally. So it's never, no longer unitary. So you, you have an admixture of both operations. Uh, the other possibility would be that you have the phasing. Okay, yeah, we have seen that also. And uh, the idea is the same one. Now you can write it for a certain period of time. So, P with this probability grows like e to minus delta t over t2. It's another transformation that acts on your density matrix and which may be uh, simultaneous to whatever gate you want to implement. So th that's the reality in experiments, apart from the fact that we never have a real pure state, we have always density matrices with more or less purity. So what you want to do is you want to characterize actually what was the, was the kind of uh, transformation that you make experimentally. And now you see that this guy is very big and very general because this transformation that you want to characterize experimentally, it goes from the city matrices to the city matrices. These guys, they are, uh, in this case, for two qubits, it will be four times four. So in the worst case scenario, 
you have to represent this linear transformation with a 16 times 16 matrix minus whatever constraints you have in your system so you would have to find a family of linearly independent input state uh, do experiments with each of them repeated times measure where they go to that means making a full tomographic set of measurements on those states and then reconstructing the matrix elements of this transformation so I've, I've found one plot that is already intimidating enough uh, so that you get scared uh, that's uh, from a two qubit experiment in the trapped ion group here in, in Innsbruck and uh, they are making a gate for two qubits and they are expanding all the coefficients of this transformation on the basic of all possible poly operations that you can have in your system okay? because that's simply another of way of expanding a matrix you can take a matrix and expand it in many different ways element wise or you can also expand it in the basis of of poly matrices and you see that there are lots of coefficients there okay? even if you are in an optimistic situation where you uh, experimentally implement U the fact is that because you have experimental imperfections in your measurements those bars they have errors okay? so you don't have a precise number so you're never going to be able to 100% uh, accurately write the elements of this transformation and that's uh, complicating the things a lot because you have a unitary and you have experimental lumps with error bars so what's the unitary that you are making? So you have to make some assumptions about what those error bars are describing and do some fitting of your model with some maximum likelihood method or whatever to find out what would be the, the closest affirmation that you make. So you have then to uh, two problems with this tomographic approach. One is the size of the Hilbert space. This doesn't scale well to big problems. And the other one is uh, experimental accuracy. Okay? So you're limited by that. You're limited by the accuracy of your measurements, the accuracy of your state preparation, if you have, I don't know, whatever number of input states that you have to use for tomography, you need to prepare each of them accurately, or at least you need some error model for that. And it complicates things a lot. So, what people are doing nowadays is uh, find alternative routes uh, towards the estimation of errors and the actual transformation you make that try to make uh, the least number of assumptions about uh, the errors that are actually taking place in your system. Uh, one very promising approach that has been uh, uh, pioneered in the world of trapped ions and which is now being used in collatoms and also in supercatting circuits for all types of tasks is what is called randomized batch marking so the, one of the goals of this uh, of this idea is randomized is to uh, characterize uh, noise the noise that is always there in your experiment separated from uh, preparation and measurement noise and also from other sources of systematic errors and uh, also it's a, a way of getting rid of exact preparation of a state okay so the idea is we are going to do a random procedure with many ingredients in them the averages of those uh, random ingredients will provide us with information about how strong the noise in your system are and we will factor out all other problems that we have in the preparation and, and realization of those gates so I'm just going to uh, copy paste a version of the algorithm, the simplest one. The idea is that we are going to study sequences of N gates. Our resource will be a group of gates 
with a certain size, which is called the unitary T2 design. Okay. I will explain to you later what this means, but this simply is a finite group of gates. Okay. This is sufficiently broad that when you compose them, you get almost all unitaries you need for averaging. And the protocol is just a loop, two loops. One is for uh, a sequence size and going from one up to M. That would be the maximum size you want to consider. Then you repeat M times and n times, just to get the statistical significance. I mean, you have a working with a quantum system, your, your measurements are probabilistic. And every time you do the same thing, you prepare one state. Let's say I'm going to call it zero. It's just the same state all the time. And then you uh, select a random random sequence of uh, n gates one, 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 one n and then you apply them and an order plus at the end you apply another gate, which is going to be n plus 1, which is simply the product of the inverses. Okay, so it's, this is simply a computer program task. So you, you have your final set of gates, you draw random numbers, experimentally you apply one after another, and then you compute what is the product of those gates, and then you apply it experimentally. When you, you don't do this in reverse order, you simply apply the gate that does this, okay? which is going to be in your set. If you design it carefully enough, and then you measure what is uh, the state of your system, whether it is in zero or not. I mean, whether it is uh, in the initial state that you have prepared or not. So at the end, what you, uh, what you do is you store the average survival probability for this uh, sequence length n. Okay, so it's the average of the probability that you remain in the initial state that you have prepared. So what do you expect that is going to happen with this probability as a function of the number of gates? It goes to zero. I mean, you can, even if it doesn't decrease in one day, you stay one year doing the experiment and it will decrease eventually. There's no way you can do a perfect experiment for arbitrarily long times. So as you are going to apply these gates, you can think of them as processes that take some time. Each of them takes some time. And during these times, we have our noise channels acting on your state for a certain period of time. So they are combining with these gates that you have there. So what this is measuring is how the combination of these gates interacts with the noise in your system, and overall it's going to depolarize and you lose it. You lose the state completely. The good thing about this procedure is that you are studying this as a function of the number of gates. And that's the only time the, uh, dependence on ends that you have there is the number of gates and the number of times that your noise is acting on your system. But preparation and measurement, they are at the beginning and at the end always, and they don't depend on the number of steps. So you separate both concepts. The noise of your uh, intermediate operations from the noise in the preparation, and apart from the fact that you can probably prepare this guy with a lot of uh, fidelity, so it's, it's, it's going to work very well for that part at least. So, uh, can I erase this?
what we are doing is that, uh, first of all, we have selected the set of gates to have some properties. One of them is that uh, you can see this. You have your um, uh, you're randomizing over different realizations. I think it was M. Okay. Of different choices of gates. Okay. If you have selected your uh, gates properly, this kind of averages converges very quickly, or is very close at least, to the average over the whole set of unitaries. If it is, this, is, this is not true for one, at least it's true when you repeat it many times. Okay? The convergence is quite fast. So the choice of case that you put here is typically going to be, for instance, for a qubit, you have identity and then uh, plus minus pi 4 rotations with Pauli matrices and plus minus pi half rot rotations with all these Pauli matrices. So it's a set of, of rotations which is uh, broad enough that when you combine all of them you really end up covering the whole block sphere very quickly. Okay? So it's the essence of this uh, effect, of this effect, of this plan is that you have more or less accurate way of approximating these averages. And what happens with the fidelity, and this is nicely explained in many different papers, um, one of them is uh, the papers by the BBN group, is that uh, this decays exponentially, you would have a constant uh, time due to systematic errors, and then you have here, uh, more or less exponential law, you can improve the fits if you want, but for our purposes is like that, where f is the dimension of your problem, this depends on the number of qubits you are dealing with, and the average fidelity of the transformation that your system is experiencing between uh, the random gates, where this average fidelity of a map is would be the average of the transformation so this will be the final transformation that you do and the measurement that you do and then all the transformation that you do in the middle and your noise somehow or in other words, this is, will be like averaging over pure states, the trace with a hard measure. So we are getting an average fidelity over all possible input states of epsilon, where we have conceptually uh, this picture in mind. You have your initial state preparation, psi zero, there are things going on, and each of these things that goes on is one random unitary, some effect of noise, another random unitary, and noise, and so on. Two, and then the final one plus one, and the measurement. Implicitly, we are assuming that the noise is somewhat independent from the gates that we apply. This is the case for uh, spontaneous emission and other things. And it's, we, we separate, it from, uh, separate the application of the gate, which we think is ideal, from the noise itself. You're following this? Okay, so we have a sequence of gates. Uh, we, we implicitly assume in this protocol that each of these gates is ideal, and we have the noise. And this is quantifying how strong your noise is. If this is close to one, then your noise is not there. If it's small, it's going to be deteriorating your system as a function of time. In real experiments, however, what happens is that uh, each of these gates, we select them from our computational space, 
they are not going to be experimentally implemented perfectly. Okay. So we, we, we will have that the gates that we make in the experiment might be some approximately close gates. So then what you can reinterpret this measurement in the following way. I wanted to make a good, good gate, but I have here some gate error. Okay. So you can consider that the gate has an error, and this error is more or less the same for all gates. And this error adds up to whatever source of noise you have in your system. So what you're calibrating with this protocol is, with this, this will be the reference, the baseline of your experiment, to be the average noise of your system combined with the average gate error of your system. Yeah. You follow this idea? Notice that we again assuming the statistical independence of errors. This this noise that affects the gate is not depending on the gate we are doing. Somehow it's an implicit assumption. And so that's what uh, you see, for instance, in the plots I showed you before. If you go to uh, the Martinez paper on the Gimon uh, gate. You have this red curve, which was, is called the reference curve. It's a, it's a curve that is made by simply applying this protocol and using a set of Clifford gates uh, as your group. And you see that the fidelity goes down exponentially, approximately. And that gives you uh, what would be this average fidelity of your uh, uh, unitary group combined with the noise of your system. That's your baseline. So whatever you do in your experiment, it is going to have at least this error per operation, just because you're there. Then the next thing that you can do is you can uh, extend these assumptions to study what happens to other gates. we are going to now call epsilon the combined um, noise and Clifford gate. That's our baseline. And now we are going to study what happens to one gate in particular. Let's call this gate W. The protocol is extended. And what we do is that after each random gate, we, ap we apply the same gate again. Do a random gate and apply the same gate again. Do a random gate and apply the same gate again. And at the end, this guy is going to contain W minus 1, U n minus 1, W minus 1, U n minus 1 minus 2, and so on. The inverse of all transformations. You follow this? And again, now, uh, we implicitly assume that this combined map is more or less independent of your gate. And it will contain the same contribution that we had before, plus whatever errors you make in your gate. Okay. So that would be the other lines that you see in those plots. So, if you go to the single qubit operations, uh, this would be the that they choose one operation, whatever, I don't know, uh, sigma x or, or, or a rotation around uh, sigma z or whatever, and they apply this protocol and they get these lines. And these lines have to be compared with the reference. So, roughly what you have is that You're going to get the same reasoning as before, but with a different F. 
Okay, and now it's a, well, it's, a, uh, it's a matter of interpretation and also of mathematical modelization, but one way you can extract numbers uh, from here would be to say the error, the average error in the reference is 1 minus f d minus 1 divided by d. Okay, that would be the average error that I get just if I do just this Clifford gate or whatever unitary group I have chosen. And uh, the average error of my gate w is going to be what is on top of that. So it's the part that is added by the introduction of this new operation. And that's how those estimates that you see on the slides appear. You have them also on the notes. You are comparing the curve which contains a gate with the curve that only contains the random operations that are the same as in both protocols. And you see that in the case of single qubits, they are very close to each other. The curve will be very close to that one. And you get the 99.8% fidelity which is very good, but you have to remember that if you do 100 operations, 99.8% repeated 100 times is like 81%. So it's good, but yeah, over, depending on the complication, the complicated protocol that you're following, you get one thing or another one. And then what they have done is the gate that we have discussed before, this uh, control C gate, is compared with the reference, and there they get a 99.0 uh, fidelity, estimated with these ideas. Okay, it's an average fidelity over all possible input states. This may be different for different input states, or and that is the implicit assumption of your how errors combine with each other. You can improve on this in different ways. Mm. Some people, what they do is they work with smaller sets of gates, which are easier to produce experimentally, and then the numbers have to be taken with a grain of salt. So it's, it's an estimate of your errors. There are groups who take it this even further. <coughs> what, one thing that we have done is that we have estimated the fidelities. Okay? But another thing that you can do is you can uh, decompose this. of uh, Clifford gates. If not the whole map, uh, at least the unital part of it, which is most of the matrix. So the idea is that instead of just computing the fidelity, which is just one number describing your map, you can actually find out what are the matrix elements of, of this map. Okay? So, and, and the idea is that you have a set of gates here, and you want to expand W in those gates. So what you do is you repeat the protocol, but instead of using W, you use CK, W, CK, dagger. You run it once with one Clifford gate, and you get one fidelity. To run it another one with a different Clifford gate, you get another fidelity. And the combination of them gives you an expansion of the, of the map in terms of those operations. That's what they do in BBN for characterizing the different supercastian circuits, and it's, it's really a powerful generalization of, of tomography to these gates. Okay, so we close here the part of, of gates. It's a more or less self-contained introduction to the ideas of uh, qubit operations. And uh, because we want to discuss uh, adiabatic quantum computing and how it's being experimentally done in the lab, it's uh, useful to look at the last type of qubits that we will introduce in these lectures.
that's a flux qubit. But so far, do you have any questions of what we have said here? We have seen so far basically uh, charge qubits and an evolution of them, which is the transmon, where the coupling degree of freedom is a charge. And now we are going to uh, move to flux qubits, which are basically some superconducting loops where we expect to have some uh, uh, right moving or left moving currents, superconducting currents that survive in those loops and live for a long time. This is a superconductor, so those, you can establish those currents and they will stay there for a long time. The question is how you uh, create those currents. Um, one way to look at that is to see the circuit it will be a circuit with one junction and some inductance. Uh, which is simply this variation of a squid with a junction and a loop providing this inductance. Through this loop you can uh, inject some external flux which is going to condition what are the lowest energy states of these superconducting loops. It's more or less uh, intuitive that if you put a magnetic field the superconductor will try to compensate that and some currents will be established in the, in the system. But another way to look at it is just to write down the Hamiltonian uh, because it's very simple, there is only one capacitive element, we can simply write the capacitive energy plus the inductive energy of each element. You have to remember that this uh, flux, you have two fluxes, uh, let's call this AB and this would be BA and quantization of the flux tells you that AB BA is the external flux that you applied in your system so that we can get rid of one of the two variables I'm going to get rid of this guy and I'm going to call this one phi so you have this Hamiltonian <coughs> as the capacitive energy of the junction or any other capacitor you add to the system, the inductive energy provided by the loop and also the Josephson, Josephson energy where you have the fa external flux minus, minus the qubit flux. I don't know if you have seen this before. Have you seen this uh, squids before? Uh, so look at this. So this is a parabola at zero. And this is a cosine that has an origin that is detected by the external flux. So it's displaced. Now there are two configurations here. The trivial one would be when you don't have any flux, you have this guy and then a cosine. And when you add both up, you end up with just, I'm, like, I'm exaggerating everything, but you would have more minima in a, in a real loop. But basically you see that you have a well-defined global minimum, which is where you define your qubit states. So this would be like a transmon, essentially. No, no different. But you can uh, shift this uh, flux so that you get here, I think it would be a pi half, uh, pi. And then you have this, and then you have this. So that the sum of both would look like something like this, where you have two stable local minima 
describing fluxes with different signs. And fluxes with different signs correspond to currents with different intensity, opposite directions. And that's basically our uh, flux qubit. The idea is there. This is the first uh, iteration of, of a flux qubit. Um, this has the problem that you have this inductor, which is there, which uh, has constraints on the sizes of your system or how you can build it. There are alternative designs, and one of them, which is very popular, was introduced uh, by Moy and collaborators. It's called uh, the three Josephson junction plus qubit, which uh, would be like this one. But you have three junctions, which are more or less symmetrically placed, and the one in the middle has a slightly different area, slightly smaller than the other ones. Okay. If I Anytime you, I lose you, just please stop me and we can discuss anything in more detail. The idea is exactly the same. So we still have a external flux going through the loop. It is simply that uh, the discussion is a bit more complicated, but this leads to a tighter and closer minima, probably, than this other design. So the fact that you can make it small. So it's not uh, too obvious if you don't know what you want to get, but you have three phase jumps, phi 1, phi alpha, and phi 2. These are the phase jumps along the three junctions. And they have to add up. to uh, 2 pi, phi 0, and the external flux that you apply. So that means I can get rid of one variable, which is typically the jump across the small junction. Why, we, why do I do it? Because it's very symmetrical. Okay. And it's also because if you write down the inductive energy of this guy, it has this form, minus Ej, cosine of phi 1, cosine of phi 2, plus alpha, cosine, let's call this phi external, minus uh, phi 1, minus phi 2. And you can invoke uh, addition of uh, trigonometric formulas to write down here twice cosine phi 1 plus phi 2 half cosine phi 1 minus phi 2 half plus alpha cosine phi external so that everything depends on the sum and difference between uh, fluxes. It's, it's not as easy as before. It uh, well, it's not too clear. Uh, I don't know if you can really see it. But you can choose the external flux to be zero. You can choose this guy to be zero. And then you have only a single minimum in the center. It's that line there. But if you increase the external flux until it becomes pi, then you get here two dark minima at two different values of the average of the phases. You well, this, this is just uh, something you can do with Mathematica. 
you can plot it by yourself and convince yourself also that uh, the minima are always located on the sum of phases in the symmetric line. No, the phase difference doesn't really matter, so that this guy is going to be frozen around phi 1 minus phi 2 0. Okay. This is going to be location of the minima. If you do that, then it's, it's much easier to analyze this. You can focus on this guy, which is phi plus, and draw this the same curves that we drew for the uh, single junction. So you have this would be cosine of phi plus, which tends to confine everything around zero flux. And then you have another uh, term which is is not so high, which is displaced because you have this phi external, which can be it has twice the period. Okay, I'm not doing, drawing it very well, but this is cosine of two phi plus. So when uh, when this is exactly pi, you can remove this guy and change the sign in front of the cosine and then you get this curve, which has two minima, symmetrically placed around zero flux. Okay, that's, that's the plot you see on the right. I have better plots on the notes if you want to have a look at them, but uh, my drawing skills are, are limited. Okay, no matter what, uh, what uh, scheme you use for this kind of flux qubits, um, the idea is always the same. You have a more or less symmetric configuration with a barrier height, which in this case depends on alpha, and two local minima, which we call left and right, which corresponds to non-zero values of the fluxes with different signs. That means different current orientations. So you can say that one is uh, this current and the other one is the other current. We have to have a look at the design to know which one. But those, those will be the general states in, general, in principle, at least from a classical point of view. Because we have um, a quantum model with uh, quantum fluctuations uh, introduced by the capacitances. There is a non-zero probability that this guy can tunnel here. So you start from two degenerate eigenstates, L right, and you end up with uh, the two uh, true eigenstates of this model, one of, one of which is, uh, for instance, this would be this one, and the other one would be this one. Symmetric and antisymmetric, and they are spaced by the tunnel amplitude delta. This tunneling is just quantum tunneling from one well to the other, because you have quantum fluctuations. Uh, the other thing that you can do is that I told you that this uh, configuration is achieved when you have here the of pi. You can uh, make the flux deviate from pi. Okay? Any external magnetic flux would shift you in one or the other direction. And uh, the consequence of that is that you can have something like this. Where this is a splitting due to the difference of flux minus pi half. 
So that your Hamiltonian in the end reads like this. Is delta half sigma x or sigma x left right plus right left plus some external field that depends on the uh, coupling between the current states and the deviations from the okay I choose this something like this so you have a magnetic dipole that interacts with deviations from the flux and you have a tunneling amplitude between those dipole orientations which is given by your tunneling amplitude delta and uh, well, just uh, we can close it here so the idea would be that your qubit is going to couple to uh, external fluxes that thread through the loop and in particular if you have here a cable a waveguide with some current going through the fields generated by this uh, the magnetic field generated by this current can thread through the uh, qubit and coupled to his magnetic dipole. Okay. So we will use this uh, next week when we talk about adiabatic quantum computing. Okay. Well, let's stop here. Uh,